gentlemen, and welcome to the 2013 Penn Literary Awards. Let's have a nice round of applause for Penn. Each year, Penn's Literary Awards recognize the brightest lights in literature and a diverse array of outstanding books. These awards represent the best of Penn's work in defense of free expression throughout the world, fighting censorship, promoting translations into English, and honoring both new and well-known authors who make up the core of Penn. Their literary voices amplify our free expression advocacy. We'd like to thank our committees for literary awards, children's books, and translation, especially the chair of the awards committee, Alice Quinn, who goes to extraordinary lengths to secure remarkable judges, judges who are themselves distinguished writers, editors, and translators. They've devoted dozens of hours to choosing such accomplished work from a surging number of, su of submissions. We are proud to honor the writers they have so carefully selected. I'd also like to give thanks to the CUNY Graduate Center for so kindly donating the use of this theater, to all the publishers who reserved space in this year's awards program to celebrate their authors, to Bauman Rare Books for donating a gift to the winner of the Penn Laura Pell's International Foundation for Theater Award for a Master American Dramatist, won this year by Larry Kramer, and to our sponsor, HBO, who join us here tonight in support of their upcoming film, The Normal Hearts, which Larry Kramer adapted for the screen. We're also grateful to all the generous donors who help endow these awards, in particular, those who've joined us here tonight. Joan and Clara Bingham, Vanessa Lilly, Kathleen Beckett, John Skipper, John Walsh, and Gary Honig of ESPN, Laura Pels, Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and Carl Spielvogel and all the other donors who couldn't be here tonight. In particular, Gerald Wheels, who died in late August. Gerald was a longtime Penn member and generous donor who endowed the Penn Nora Magid Award for editing. And as our past Penn president, Joel Canero, recalls, Gerald, like his brilliant companion, Nora Magid, was a beloved mentor to decades of University of Pennsylvania students. He was a prize-winning scholar of extraordinary range, remarkable intelligence, and an irresistible sense of humor, and he will be sorely missed. Thank you all again for coming, and please welcome back to the microphone the indefatigable Andy Borowitz. Peter Godwin, let's hear it for Peter. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin, let's have a nice round of applause for all of tonight's award winners sitting up on stage here. Show them a little bit of love. So a bunch of us were uh, sitting around at the Penn offices uh, talking about tonight's awards. Um, it was Philip Roth, me, people like that. <laughs> and. Uh, and we decided that my, my job as MC is to move us as quickly as possible uh, to the best part of the evening, uh, the reception. And um, really, the only obstacles standing in our way are tonight's award winners. <laughs> because, you know, there's this kind of, there's this kind of paradox about, about writers is, you know, when we're facing a blank page, we sometimes struggle to come up with words. Um, but you put us anywhere near a microphone, and uh, well, you know what? We could be here all fucking night. So I, I just, um, I just decided uh, that I would, I would try to tell them, you know, maybe to keep it short. And then I realized, you know, that's really kind of breaking the first rule of writing, which is show, don't tell, right? So I decided I would illustrate how anything could be made a little bit more concise if we just try. Uh, to do that, I've taken three of the greatest works of world literature and reduced them to that most concise literary form, haiku. So let me, let me do this as a way of showing and not telling. Call me Ishmael. Hundreds of pages later, 
holy crap, a whale. <laughs> Poor Gregor Samsa, turning into a cockroach? That's so Kafka-esque. <laughs> finally, happy families, all alike. Unhappy ones, they are all Russian. <laughs> so there you have it. Are we ready for the show, ladies and gentlemen? We ready, winners? Coming to the stage, let's hear for Kamiko Han. Kamiko? I wasn't nervous, but now I feel like an obstacle. Thank you. <laughs> yes, good evening. My name is Kimiko Han. The Penn Stephen Kroll Award for Picture Book Writing is for exceptional writing in an illustrated children's book. The award was established in memory of Stephen Kroll, a former Penn trustee and longtime chair of Penn's Children's Young Adult Book Authors Committee to acknowledge the distinct literary contributions of picture book writers. The award is made possible by Kathleen Beckett, who is in the audience. So I would like to applaud her, Kathleen. <clears throat> The judges for this award are Barbara Shook Hazen, Cheryl Willis Hudson, and David Wiesner. The winner is Michelle Markell for The Fantastic Jungles of Henri Rousseau. Markell's spare prose perfectly recreates Rousseau's calling to paint affinity for nature, creative process, and determination, even in the face of complete public rejection. Congratulations, Michelle. Come on up. It is utterly fantastic and surreal to be acknowledged by this noble organization. I'd like to offer profound thanks to Kathleen, to the awards committee, and to the judges. I'm indebted to my supportive husband and to my father, <clears throat> who was an airline mechanic in Los Angeles and used to bring home New Yorkers, the people left behind on the airplanes. And those stories made me want to be a writer. I'm deeply grateful to my agent and to everyone at the Erdman's Publishing House. Anita Erdman's is here tonight. Erdman's had the vision to select Amanda Hall to illustrate the book, which she did with such elegance and emotion. And I love that she included Guillaume Apollinaire, Alfred Jarry, the Steins, and other greats in the party scenes. Finally, I must thank Henry Rousseau for wheeling his paintings in a handcart across the streets of Paris to the Salon, to the big art show, year after year, only to be savaged by the critics. But at last, he found validation. So we got the sleeping gypsy and the jungle fantasies and a sad, beautiful narrative I could turn into a picture book. I'm inexpressibly honored to receive this award. My heart is floating. Thank you so much. The Penn Phyllis Naylor o Working Writer Fellowship is presented to an author of children's or young adult fiction who has published at least two novels, and it is specifically to complete a book-length work in progress. The fellowship, established in 2001, is supported by an endowment fund established by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor. The judges for this award were Angela, Angela Johnson, Deborah Helligman, and Julie Ann Peters. The winner is Amy Goldman Koss for the Intake Office. And <laughs> thanks. thanks. Hi, I'm Amy Koss, and I am thrilled to be here. In creating this fellowship, Phyllis Naylor must have known that the middle-aged, mid-list, middle-grade author sometimes hits that spot where sales and spirits sag. 
And in spite of our continued typing, we begin to suspect that we are the last to hear of our deaths. Then, aha, Phyllis Naylor swoops in with this generous grant to assure us that we're not dead yet. <laughs> and for that, I want to thank her and the Penn community overall, and Susan Patron, who nominated me, and my three wise judges, none of whom I bribed, and my great agent, Linda Pratt, sitting right over there in red, and whoever my next editor will be, whoever he or she will be for this book, I thank them. <laughs> The Penn Translation Prize for a book-length translation of prose into English published in 2012 uh, has been supported since 1963 in recognition of the art of the literary translator and um, was the first American award to do so. The judges were Margaret Carson, Bill Johnston, and Alex Zucker. The runner-up for this distinguished award is Catherine Silver for The Cardboard House by Martine Adan. <laughs> the winner is Donald O. White for The Island of Second Sight by Albert Vigolais Thalen. And this, was, uh, uh, this is a novel that was written in German in 1953, yet set on the Spanish island of Mallorca in the 1930s. And it uh, presented a formidable challenge to the translator, not the least its uh, multilingual dimension. Donald, congratulations. I wish to thank Penn America for this really tremendous honor. And specifically, of course, the three translation prize judges who have come up with such a strongly positive citation. I would also like to mention a few individuals who were instrumental in getting Vigolais Talen's Island of Second Sight into print. First of all, my sincere thanks go to two persons living in Cambridge, England. Isabel Weiss was familiar with Talon's work in the original German. She was puzzled that no English translation of the island had appeared. She learned indirectly that I had in fact done such a translation and that I was still hunting for a publisher. Isabel consulted her Cambridge friend, Robert Hyde, the managing director of Galileo Publishers, and together they set about producing this 800-plus page work in its first edition. In this country, Peter Mayer and his staff at Overlook Press have brought out not one but three new printings of Taylan's Island one in elegant hardcover, and now recently in paperback and Kindle editions. Finally, but by no means least of all, let me thank my personal in-house editor, my amazing wife, Drusilla. With a watchful eye for style, readability, and punctuation, she has helped me clean up any number of lapses and obscurities. In two words, her help with the island of second sight has been simply indispensable. Thank you again, Pan America. The Penn Award for Poetry in Translation for a book-length translation of poetry into English published in 2012. Um, I would like to recognize the donor, the Chaplin Foundation. 
and the judge, Don Mi Choi. First, the runners up for this distinguished award um, are two, Rosemary Waldrop for Almost One Book, Almost One Life by Elfridi Tzerda, and Rosala Akala, Spit Temple by Cecilia Vicuña. And uh, I believe Rosa is in the audience. Would you like to stand and be acknowledged? <laughs> The winner is Molly Weigel for The Shock of the Lenders and Other Poems by Jorge Santiago Perednik. And um, Weigel magnificently contextualizes and reenacts the complex effects of terror, Perednik's survival and experimentation during Argentina's dirty war. Molly, please come up to the mic. First, I'd like to say thank you to the Penn American Center and to the award judge, Don Mi Choi, for honoring me with this award. And in a way, I feel this award is also for all uh, translators of experimental um, and or politically engaged poetry. Um, so. It's great to be here to represent that sort of small but hearty band. Thank you to Johannes Gorenson and Joelle McSweeney of Action Books, along with their designer, Andrew Schutte, for rising beautifully to the typographic and design challenge set by the book, and for their sensitivity in creating the book as an honor to Jorge Perednik who died while the book was in process. I also thank Jorge Santiago Perednik for his friendship and for allowing me to inhabit his complex and capacious work. And I would like to thank my family who have supported me and cheered me on through the process over the years. Uh, I wish that Jorge Perednik could be here with us today and I'm going to evoke his presence by ending these remarks with a quote of his on translation. He himself translated widely, Olson, Nabokov, Cummings, and Rothenberg, among many others. In an essay on translating Nabokov, Perednik writes, what makes translation interesting is that it relates two distinct pieces of writing and affirms in some oblique way that they are identical, which brings the reader an enrichment or complication in his tasks, the result of translating a piece of literary writing for whoever likes literature beyond the telegraphic or beyond spiritualism can be more than a message or the invocation of an absence. It can be another piece of literary writing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kamiko, for presenting those awards. And now our next presenter, let's hear it for Minna Proctor. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Minna Proctor. I am very proud to be here presenting these awards tonight. Um, the first award that I am presenting is for the Penn Heim Translation Fund grants. Um, it supports the translation of book-length works into English. The Heim Translation Fund was established in the summer of 2003 by a gift from Priscilla and Michael Henry Heim in response to the dismayingly low numbers of literary translations currently appearing in English. 
Over the 10 years of its existence, the fund has given grants to a total of 108 translations from over 30 languages, including Armenian, Basque, Estonian, Farsi, Finland, Swedish, Lithuanian, and Mongolian, as well as French, Spanish, German, Russian, Chinese, Japanese, and Arabic. Almost all of these projects go on to publication, which is a tremendous record of success in translation land. And this year in particular saw a surge of applications, which meant that the competition was stiffer than ever, and hopefully that many more translation projects are now coming our way. The award is made possible by Priscilla Heim and Amazon.com, and the um, the judge, I, I just, I just want to, uh, as a parenthesis, say I think that they w Penn wanted me to give this award because as a translator, I have um, some facility with foreign languages. Uh, what I didn't tell them was that I'm actually syllabically dyslexic. <laughs> so I am now going to pronounce many names for you. And I hope you'll forgive me, especially if I know you well. Um, <laughs> The, the Haim Advisory Board, the judges, were made up of Susan Bernovsky, Barbara Epler, Richard Sieberth, Lauren Wine, Elliot Weinberger, Natasha Wimmer, Matvey Yanklovich, and chaired by Michael F. Moore. The winners, Daniel Bertsotsky, Isabel Cole, Sean Cotter, Chloe Garcia Roberts, Edward Galvan, Eleanor Goodman, Marilyn Hacker, Elizabeth Harris, Jennifer Hayashida, Eugene Ostashevsky, and Danielle Mellis, Jeremy Tiang, Annie Tucker, and Lara Vignaud. The fund is also pleased to announce that the nominee for a 2013 New York State Council on the Arts Translation Grant went to Isa Wojciechowska, and that was awarded in January. I, I would like to ask all of the grantees that are here to stand up so that we can applaud you. The next award is the Penn Jacqueline Bograd Weld Award for Biography. For a distinguished biography published in 2012, the, work, the winning title is a work of exceptional literary narrative and artistic merit based on scrupulous research. The award donors are Rodman L. Drake and Jacqueline Bograd Weld. The judges, Debbie Applegate, Peter Orner, and Charles Shields. The runner-up for the award, Gordon Bowker, was for the work James Joyce. And the winner, whose work was, um, just going back to the scrupulous, it's not scrupulous research, according to the judge's citation, it is a miracle of research, goes to Tom Reese for The Black Count. Well, given that I have only 90 seconds, um, I would have to choose between giving a responsible thank you speech, which in the case of a book that is a miracle of research dependent on a, the miraculous help of um, basically close to 100 people, including an amazing man who I visited in France last week um, named Francois Ango, to present him a copy of the book, and he happens to be in a coma at the moment I presented it to him. I had to give it to him at his hospital bed, but I have heard today that he actually actually came out of the coma, and he now has the book, so um, <laughs> another thing to applaud. And um, obviously the judges, um, the uh, to pen, the wonderful members of my family in the audience, publisher, and on and on and on, but I will use any 90 seconds to say something about my subject, so I'd like to say something about General Alex Dumas speaking really quickly. So Alex Dumas, he's the son of a black slave who rose by the time he was 30 to command entire armies during the French Revolution. He rivaled Napoleon. He is the highest ranking black officer um, in a white society before Colin Powell and 
Of course, his adventures inspired the Count of Monte Cristo and the Three Musketeers. Yet, in France, a country that is awash in marble generals, there is not a single statue anywhere in France of General Dumas. And even when his son, the novelist Alexandre Dumas, had all the money and fame in the world, he could not get the government of France through his whole life to put up any commemoration honoring his father, the great black hero of the French Revolution. There was finally a statue put up in honor of General Dumas at the beginning of the 20th century. The Nazis tore it down in 1940. Now, it's not hard to understand why the Nazis would want to tear down the statue honoring the great mixed race general, uh, mixed race hero of the French Revolution, but it is a little harder for me to understand why um, the current government of France would want to continue to keep his memory buried. For many years, small groups of activists tried to get some commemoration of General Dumas in Paris, and now there is a single plaque that sits in front of a sort of modern sculpture honoring or commemorating the memory of slavery in the French Empire. It is a rusty pair of 10 foot high slave shackles. And as I said, I was in Paris last week, and when you walk by this monument, usually you see a bunch of kids drinking beer and smoking and sitting in the middle of the slave shackles because they're an incredible, com incredibly comfortable couch. Um, of course, they're covered in graffiti, and I just want to say, aside from my biography, I really do believe that General Dumas deserves a statue. But thank you so much for this award. I am deeply honored. I, I don't know how they can refuse them now. The next award is the Penn E. O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award for a book of literary nonfiction on the subject of the physical or biological sciences published in 2012. The award was founded by scientist and author Dr. Edward O. Wilson, activist and actor Harrison Ford, and the E. O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. And the inaugural award was conferred in 2011. The judges for this award were Deborah Bloom, Catherine Bouton, and Jerome Groupman. The runner-up, David George Haskell, was for The Forest Unseen, and I think he's here. Would you stand up? Thank you. The winner is Len Leonard Mladenov for uh, a Subliminal, which I'm apparently, I think, reading now on my Kindle. Um, and he's not present tonight, but his editor, Edward Kastemeyer, is to accept on his behalf. Thank you. I just have a few words from Len. He very much wanted to be here, but uh, he said, I'm sorry I can't be here tonight because I had a prior commitment to be in Brazil. Seems like a pretty good excuse. Brazil is a lovely country, but I wish I could be in New York to accept this amazing honor. And more important, to attend what I expect will be an amazing party afterward. So I think he shares that with you. Uh, and to have the chance to talk to all of you. I'd like to thank the Penn Center the distinguished judges, Deborah Bloom, Catherine Boughton, Jerome Groupman. The award is only as good as their taste and sophistication with regard to literature. So I am doubly honored because it is such an illustrious group of judges. I'd also like to acknowledge the runner up, David George Haskell, who wrote The Forest Unseen because I've been a judge for a book award before and also a runner up myself and I know that the voting is close and the decision rarely unanimous. The award means a lot to me because I took a chance in writing a book outside the field of physics and math in which I was trained, and also because it is dedicated to my mother's sister, who was otherwise just a nameless teen killed by the Nazis more than 70 years ago. The dedication is there for good reason, which you'll have to read the book to learn. Finally, I would like to thank my agent, Susan Ginsberg, and my editor, Edward Kastenmeier, the man reading this to you. Uh, I thank them for their friendship, their moral support, and most of all, for their advice while I was writing this book. Thank you on behalf of Len.
My last award tonight, um, just my last award, is the, the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award for Nonfiction. This is going to an author of distinguished book of general nonfiction that possesses notable literary merit, critical perspective, and it illuminates important contemporary issues that has been published in the United States during 2011 or 2012. The, the Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Company makes this award possible. And our judges were Eliza Griswold, Maya Jasanov, and Edward Mendelssohn. The runner-up, Donovan Hahn, for Moby Duck, is here with us today in the audience. <laughs> And the winner is Catherine Boo for Behind the Beautiful Forevers. Thanks to the judges and to Penn uh, and to uh, two formidable editors who have supported me professionally and personally uh, through some difficult shit over many years, uh, David Remnick and Kate Medina and I donate the rest of my 90 seconds to the party. Thanks. Let's hear it for that. It's amazing. Thank you, Minna Proctor, for presenting those awards. And now let's bring the next presenter to the stage, Dino Mengastu. Good evening. My name is Dina Mangestu, and it's my pleasure to open with um, the Penn Open Book Award for an exceptional book-length work of literature by an author of color published in 2012. This award is made possible by the Rochelle Ratner Fund, and the judges for the prize were Cyrus Cassell, Porchisa Kapoor, and Tiffany Yannick. The co-winners for tonight's prize are Gina Apostle for The Gun Dealer's Daughter and Kevin Young, for the Gray Album. Thank you. Truth is concrete, says Brecht, quoting Lenin, who was quoting Hegel, quoting St. Augustine. <laughs> and to me, Fiction is the house of concrete that builds truth. I am honored by this prize from Penn America because of the support Penn gives to writers around the world, building that house of truth that is art. I'd like to thank the judges for choosing this unknown book about acts of revolution in the Philippines. I'd like to thank my agent, Kirby Kim, and Denise Scarfi, and everyone else at Norton. Most of all, I'd like to thank my family, Ken and Anastasia, who both understand that there is not only one way to be revolutionary, that art is a form of activism. Lastly, I'd like to share this prize with my late husband, Arnie Tangerlini, the first reader of this novel. He taught me how Antonio Gramsci had read Karl Marx how our human need to make art is reason enough to seek revolution in the first place. Thanks again to Pan America. Thank you so much uh, to Penn and the judges. Um, I'd also like to thank Grey Wolf Press for taking a chance on a poet writing prose. Um, the book, The Gray Album, is a book that goes from slavery to the present, from uh, the spirituals to hip hop, so I f they were in for a long book. Um, and so I was appreciated them taking a chance. I'd like to thank my agent, Rob, my friends and family, including Colson, whom uh, The Gray Album is dedicated to. To my favorite editor, uh, Kate Tuttle, my wife, and I'd also um, like to leave you, rather than a, with a poem from myself, uh, I thought I'd leave you with some advice from Langston Hughes, who I write about in the book. Advice, 
Folks, birthing is hard and dying is mean. So be sure to get yourself some loving in between. Yeah. Thank you. Our next award this evening is the Penn Diamond Scene Spielvogel Award for the Art of the Essay. For a book of essays published in 2012 that exemplifies the dignity and esteem that the essay form imparts to literature. This prize is made possible with the support of Barbara, Barbara Lee Diamond Scene and Carl Spielvogel, who I believe in our, are in the audience. Could you please stand up? And the judges for the prize are Sven Burkertz, Robert Gottlieb, and Mark Kramer. The runners up for the award are Jill Lepore for The Story of America, Essays on Origins, and Daniel Mendelssohn for Waiting for the Barbarians. Daniel, I believe, is with us in the audience. And the winner of the prize is Robert Haas for What Light Can Do. Well, the thrill of this uh, award for me was to have my name associated with Daniel Mendelssohn and Jill Lepore's and, and with the re distinguished judges, Robert Gottlieb, Sven Burkitz, and Mark Kramer, who put my name there. I need to thank Penn for existing, Penn staff for the crucial work that they do for writers all around the world. I need to thank my uh, editor and publisher, Daniel Halpern, I need to thank uh, Barbara Lee Diamondstein and Carl Spie, uh, Spielvogel for their generosity and vision. And, and I particularly want to thank my young editor at Echo, Harper Collins, um, Libby Edelson, who really imagined this book into being and then helped me to get it there. I owe a great thanks to her. Thanks very much. Our, ne our next award is for the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize. To an author whose debut work, a first novel or collection of short stories published in 2012, represents distinguished literary achievement and suggests great promise. This prize is made possible with the support of the family of Robert Bingham. Clara and Joan Bingham, I believe, are here with us in the audience. The judges for the prize are Daniel Evans, Tom Drury, and Donald Ray Pollock. And the winner is Sergio de la Pava for a Naked Singularity. Thank you. Uh, thanking Susanna de la Pava at this stage of my life feels redundant. Um, tr truth is, I don't have the strongest sense of where I end as a human being and she begins anymore. So dependent am I on her for everything positive in my life. But out of an excess of caution, I am going to say thank you, Susanna, and in the interest of <laughs> domestic tranquility. Uh, <laughs> mainly also for the two lives that I get to see develop uh, closely. Um, two individuals, they know who they are, they're here and I'm sure one of them is gonna be up till about two in the morning doing homework as a result of his attendance here. The, I earlier today met the Bingham family, um, in particular Joan Bingham, Clara Bingham, and Vanessa Lilly, and uh, they were as gracious and generous and lovely as you would expect of people who have um, so greatly supported literary art in this country through this prize, so I wanna thank them certainly. And I wanna say that I'm sure they created this award um, in honor of a literary comet that was taken from us too soon and in the interest of creating something positive out of tragedy and I want them to understand that I understand my responsibility to create more positivity as a result of this award. I have a enviable relationship with the University of Chicago, um, certainly with respect to what I value in writing and literature, and I'm thankful mainly to them and mainly to Margaret Hivner and Levi Stahl at that university press. Thank you for, to the judges. Um, 
and an apology for the length of the novel. I know that if I was judging and somebody handed me a 700 densely uh, typed pages, uh, my strong predilection would be to find every possible flaw with that novel so that I wouldn't have to finish it. <laughs> so I thank you for resisting that, um, that inclination, which I'm sure was there. The absolutely most critical part about this award for me is that it's coming from Penn. Um, a, the mission of Penn, the creation of Penn, what gives it its animating spirit is this perhaps a quaint notion that human beings have a responsibility to other human beings, even if it's just the responsibility of fair dealing. And I'm gonna ask for a little bit of indulgence in going over my 90 seconds because uh, what you may not know is that I am also an attorney um, but before you judge me too harshly, the only job I've ever had is a public defender here in New York. Um, my wife and I have both dedicated our professional lives to the protection of the individual's rights against um, an unfeeling system. So given that this award is from Penn, given what their mission is, um, although they every year grow in efficacy, it's still rather disconcerting that their work uh, remains as relevant today as it did 91 years ago. It's um, a bit disturbing. Earlier today, I spent a couple hours in what's called the Manhattan Detention Center, or sometimes called the tombs, and I can tell you that that's exactly what it feels like. It feels like a tomb. When a human being is incarcerated, um, you have stripped them of all dignity. I don't think, in researching Penn, I don't think it's a coincidence that you see that when um, that incarceration is a tool used by the powerful in essence to silence people who are saying something that is somehow harmful to those in power or uh, more um, relevant to today's topic to what I'm talking about entire segments of society are being essentially removed from the sight of uh, society at large so um, certainly that's beyond the strictures of this brief speech but I ask you to have some curiosity and ask yourself and perhaps do some research and wonder why um, the, the, this country's incarceration rate has essentially quintupled at a time that a crime, violent crime especially, has been dropping and ask yourself what could possibly explain that. Obviously this is a literary award, it was judged essentially on, on the aesthetic um, qualities of a novel purportedly. And I, I also call on those people who have a voice, who write novels, to ask themselves if they're, in essence, engaging in the large questions, doing the kind of work that is in the seminal works of Mark Twain or John Steinbeck or Ralph Ellison or James Baldwin, or if, in fact, they're not retreating into themselves and myopically putting forth what is essentially a self-absorbed view of the world that views no responsibility to society at large. It seems to me from the outside looking in that contemporary literature has taken a wrong turn somehow. This book was a republished book which gives me the opportunity to change the dedication, which I will do now. I dedicate this book now instead to the two million plus people who are incarcerated in this country at this moment and hope that society take seriously the responsibility to, to reduce that number over the ensuing years. Thank you. Our next award is the Penn Nora Maggot Award for Excellence in Editing. To honor a magazine editor whose high literary taste has, throughout his or her career, contributed significantly to the excellence of the publication he or she edits. This award is made possible by a grant from the late Gerald Wheels, a longtime member of Penn who we pay our respects to once again this evening. The judges for this prize are Jin Ah, Robin Desser, and Anna Holmes. And the co-winners for this prize are Monica Bowerlin and Clara Jeffrey, co-editor of Mother Jones. We're gonna have to put in a poetry section. Um, Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here uh, with these great judges, these great nominees, um, all the wonderful people that support Penn and the great work it does. We're particularly honored to get an award that um, historically looks at not just the editors at the top of the masthead, but 
that, that honors the work of people up and down the masthead, all the great things that they do. As anyone who's ever put out a publication knows, you know, we, we reap the rewards of all the hard work, dedication, and brilliance of our staff, from the fact checkers to the editors, reporters, designers, programmers, and everybody else involved in making a great publication. You would think that um, having been co-editors for seven years now, we would feel, you know, an itch, you know, we would feel like we are really over this partnership thing, but in fact, um, it's better than it's ever been, and it's, you know, starting to appear to us as if partnership is the new great men. Um, <laughs> Which is why we also accept this award, you know, in honor of all the wonderful people we work with um, at Mother Jones and beyond. And we are especially moved to receive an award um, established by Gerald Wheels in honor of his collaborator and life partner, Nora McGid. And we pledge to carry on their legacy of collaboration for a long time. Well, we're into the home stretch now, and I just want to pause to say that I've noticed a theme in the remarks tonight is that a lot of writers have said that it's the responsibility of writers to contribute something productive uh, to the greater world, to society. And I take those remarks as a personal attack on me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Morgan Etrickin. Good evening. Uh, the first award I will be presenting is the Penn Joyce Osterweil Award for Poetry, which honors a new and emerging poet of any age who has not published more than one book of poetry. It's given in odd-numbered years and recognizes the high literary character of the published work to date of a new and emerging voice in American poetry and the promise of further literary achievement. Please join me in acknowledging Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, who have made this award possible. The judges for this award are Henri Cole, Dorian Lowe, and Robert Wrigley. The runner-up is Thomas Q. Morin, and the winner of the Penn Joyce Osterweil Award for Poetry is Rowan Ricardo Phillips. I'll cite uh, the judge's citation, I'll read from it. Uh, Rowan Ricardo Phillips can be sweetly Whitmanesque in his poems or gravely meditative or lushly lyrical. In other words, he is a poet capable of voices, plural. Every poem in the ground surprises the reader with its vivid images and rhythms or its fully present personal voice or its lightning bolt sincerity. And while there is often a hidden tragedy at the center of his poems, there is also great pleasure taken in the idea of survival during a time of chaos. Rowan? Wow, this is great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not any of those incredibly kind words tonight. You should actually pity me because my mother and my wife are here and sitting side by side, which <laughs> leaves me, they love each other, so that's great, but it's kind of left me um, paralyzed and, uh, and dumb. Um, but they're both, they're, they serve as my diastole and my systole, and I'm incredibly grateful for them. My mother had the uh, incredibly foolish notion of bringing a lot of Shakespeare into the house from a very young age, uh, encouraging me to be creative, to do whatever I want, just make sure that you're aggressive in it, and do the right thing, um, and think about why you do things. Uh, my wife, Nuria, first of all, that photo was taken by uh, my wife, Nuria. She's a much better artist than I am and a sweeter soul than I could ever hope to be. Uh, if I've ever written a letter in a word without thinking of her, it's been the wrong word. So thank you to, to both of you. Thank you, Penn. Thank you, the judges. Not my peers, but my betters. What I love about this award is that it's not for something you've necessarily done, but some kind of diaphanous something that may happen in your work. In this way, it's a beautiful nocturnal flower of a gift. Um, I'm reminded of the end of Shakespeare's Sonnet 116, which is about love and marriage, but it ends, if this be error and upon me proved, 
I never writ nor no man ever loved. And uh, I hope they're not wrong. I love the idea of paying things forward, um, and I love, I love the humanness in, in these types of awards. I think it's very reminiscent of what Penn is about. It's not about only the actual, but about um, the possible, not just the plausible, but what we can do beyond the plausible. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you all my wonderful fellow writers and thinkers. Yes, Mother Jones, have a poetry section. Uh, <laughs> Um, thank you once again, my beautiful mother, for everything you've ever done to me and for me. And of course, thank you also, Nuria Testimu, Pisca Catalunya, muchas gracias. Uh, the next award is the Penn ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing, which honors a nonfiction book on the subject of sports published in 2012. If you could please join me in acknowledging John Skipper, John Walsh, and Gary Honig of ESPN who have made this award possible. The judges uh, for this award are Ben McGrath, uh, Jane Levy, and William Leach. And the winner of the Penn ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing is Mark Cram, Jr. for his book, Like Any Normal Day. Mark Cram, Jr.'s Like Any Normal Day is a tale of great moment, rendered with exquisite understatement and elegant restraint. In telling the story of Buddy Miley, a high school quarterback turned quadriplegic whose life snaps in half with one snap of the ball, Cram compels readers to consider the violence routinely enacted on fields of play and the actions we'd be willing to take to alleviate its consequences. Each of the characters in Buddy's world, the mother turned caregiver, the girlfriend who loved him as long and as well as she could, the father handcuffed by emotion, the linebacker whose hit snaps life in half, the younger brother who helps him die, is treated with humanity and respect. In the hands of a less magnanimous, less, less gifted author, like any normal day, might have plunged into bathos or unwanted moralizing about assisted suicide. Instead, with his first book, Cram has given us a small, polished jewel that enlarges the world of sports and ennobles the genre of literary sports journalism. Mark, if you could please join me. As someone who, as a boy, struggled mightily with reading and experienced no small degree of embarrassment because of it, I cannot begin to tell you the significance this honor holds for me. To Penn, ESPN, the judges Jane Levy, William Leach, and Ben McGrath, I am most grateful. Frank, it's such a thrill to share this evening with you. You do not have a more ardent admirer. I think anyone who has had the pleasure to know you would agree that you're not just a wonderful writer, but a truly kind man. Thank you for your generosity. Opportunity does, opportunity does not always present itself when one wants or needs it, but I have been extraordinarily blessed. Good luck has placed me in the able hands of Andrew Blauner, who is not only an astute literary agent, but a true gentleman. It is our mutually held belief that worthy books eventually find their way. Like any normal day found its way to St. Martin's Press and its editor-in-chief, George Whitty, who shared my view that the story of Buddy Miley begged at the universal question, what is our duty to one another as human beings? I think it is a question uh, that we should uh, take some time to ponder. George, thank you for the opportunity of a lifetime. To the Miley's, all of you, thank you for your openness and your honesty. Mrs. Rosemary Miley, I will always call, carry you in my heart. Jimmy Miley, how brave you were, not just the sh shoulder the sorrow of your beloved, beloved brother, Buddy, but to tear back the scar tissue and relive with me that dark time. Karen Kohlmeyer, 
Thank you for taking this complicated journey with me and for your courage in enduring the pain that emerged along the way. Pat Delaney, where would I have been without you? And Buddy, you were so strong in life. I hope you have found eternal peace. Finally, I would like to remember my dear parents, my mother Joan and my late father Mark, who I know would be so pleased by this honor. My talented daughters, Corey and Olivia, and above all others, my wife, Anne, who I love very, very much. The next award is the Penn ESPN Lifetime Achievement Award for Literary Sports Writing, which honors a writer whose body of work represents an exceptional contribution to the field. The award was established in 2011. The judges for this award are David Granger, Laura Hillenbrand, and Steve Eisenberg. And the winner of the Penn ESPN award, a Lifetime Achievement Award for Literary Sports Writing is Frank DeFord. Frank DeFord erased the distinction between sports writing and writing. He did it by crafting ambitious, deeply reported, stylistically aggressive features for a weekly sports publication. He covered nearly every sport and he varied his approach with nearly every assignment. He could make you laugh out loud, he could make you cry, he would occasionally write from a deep well of outrage and all along the way he found an essential humanity in the people he chose to write about. Frank was and is an artist, a reporter, and a prose stylist, and he was as influential on writers and editors in the 80s and 90s as anyone working in any realm. Frank, along with a few other pioneers, led the way for two entire generations of writers, Gary Smith, Tony, Tony Kornheiser, and Charlie Pierce in one generation, and guys like S.L. Price, and maybe even Wright Thompson in the next, practitioners who saw themselves as writers about sports. As, a, as opposed to sports writers. Frank, if you'd please join me to accept your award. Thank you, Morgan. That's uh, all the more meaningful that he presented me this because he's been my editor and publisher on two books and I don't think we ever had a cross patch, did we? <laughs> And also here, editor and publisher, is my agent of 48 years, Sterling Lord, which I think is a lifetime achievement in itself. <laughs> but of course, I'm, I'm most grateful to, to Penn for this, this, this wonderful honor. Uh, to ESPN, I thank for presenting it. And of course, to the judges for their gracious wisdom in, in selecting me. Um, I've been... Um, very fortunate that I, most of my work was, was published for so many years in Sports Illustrated, which operated on, on the very prime premise that sports writing could be literature, just like every uh, other kind of writing. And nothing, I suppose, uh, sustains that more than the fact that last year's winner, Dan Jenkins, was also from Sports Illustrated. And I don't think there are two more different writers than myself and Dan. And yet there we were together, and here we are winning this award. And, and it's a delight for me to be uh, in his company officially at last. And, and this award does have a special meaning in that I am sharing the sports spotlight this evening with Mark Cram, who you've already met, uh, the author of a perfectly wonderful book, which, which you should read. Um, Mark's, Mark's late father, who we mentioned, also Mark Cram, also a superb sports writer and also a colleague of mine at Sports Illustrated. How often we talked about sports writing as, as literature uh, late into the night. And I know how pleased Mark he would be uh, to know that his son and his old buddy are being celebrated together tonight. So you can see that there are so many reasons which make this a very special evening for me. Well, next, I'd like to uh, present the Penn Laura Pells International Foundation for Theater Award for an American playwright in mid-career. 
This award was developed to reflect Laura Pels' dedication to supporting excellence in American theater, as well as Penn's commitment to recognizing and rewarding the literary accomplishments of playwrights. If you would adjo join me in acknowledging the Laura Pels International Foundation for Theater, which has generously made this award possible. Laura, if you could please stand. The judges for this award are Pam McKinnon, Chris McElroan, and Tim McHenry. And the winner of the Penn Laura Pell's International Foundation for Theater Award for an American Playwright in Mid-Career is Kirsten Greenidge. For the American Playwright in Mid-Career Award, the committee wants to encourage Kirsten Greenidge to add to her body of work. Her plays Rust, Bossa Nova, Sans Culottes in the Promised Land, Gibson Girl, Milk Like Sugar, and Luck of the Irish, among others, have been seen around the country for more than a decade. They are inherently political and provocative, while also deliciously funny. Kirsten gives voice to largely underrepresented characters, placing them in compellingly inventive yet achingly familiar worlds. Whether careening teens or urban professionals or formal, former NFL stars or stressed out housekeepers, her characters speak a muscular poetry that is all her own and is at once accessible and heightened, pleasing and jarring. Kirsten is a rare writer who incisively takes on issues of race, race culture, class, and hierarchy, always attending to the moment-to-moment -moment emotional journey and a rewarding story. Her plays are inclusive, complicated, bold, and American. Actors love her people and language, directors love her stories and themes, and audiences lean in. Kirsten, if you could please join me to accept your work. Thank you, thank you, Pen America. Thank you, Laura Pels. Um, writing can be very lonely. It can be isolated and isolating. The work is rewarding, but the world surrounding that work can be rather cold and um, a brackish sea. I wanted to be a playwright since I was 12. A uh, playwright is a strange thing to be. You work for years and years on something, not knowing if it will be seen by anybody. You labor over one word for days, uh, but you put it in the play, and if you're lucky, you have a room full of colleagues tell you why it should be changed. Uh, you go for weeks eating badly and sleeping little and missing your kids' bedtimes. You tell your friends and family you'll call after you open, you'll do coffee, that you're going to take a break from working. But then the next idea comes, and the next call comes, and it begins again. You realize yourself at 12 might have known what she was talking about better than you do as an adult, because this is what you are. I read about women and poor people and black people, and it took many years to see my work on stage to be promised more than a reading. So this award comes as a surprise, um, uh, because uh, the longer I was spent in this business, the more I thought that I'd never be someplace like this being uh, recognized for my body of work. Uh, doing what I love has often meant drowning in that cold, brackish sea. Um, there are some people, though, that have refused to let me drown there, and those are all of my teachers uh, at Cambridge Friends School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, at Arlington High School, uh, at the University of Iowa, at Wesleyan University, and um, all the theaters that have taken a chance on me, the Huntington, uh, the Hoya Playhouse, um, uh, Yale Repertory, Playwrights Horizons, Women's Theater Project, LTC3, and The Magic, um, uh, have, are all, and Company One in Boston, are all places that have um, uh, put a value on my work that I never thought I would uh, see. And so for the, those people, I am truly grateful. I'd also like to thank my agents, Bruce uh, Osler and Mark Orsini, and my family and my husband, uh, Ronald Nigro, uh, who put up with incredibly horrible hours in the theater, and they accept many more dinners of fish sticks than I thought I would be giving them. Um, all of you have made that brackish sea quite warm, so thank you very much. The final award that will be presented this evening is the Penn Laura Pell's International Foundation for Theater Award for Master American Dramatist, the winner of which was selected by the same judges. I would now like to welcome the actor Mark Ruffalo who will be presenting this award.
Amen. Um, it is my great honor to be here tonight and to be asked by Penn to present this award to Larry Kramer, whose fearless work obscures the boundaries between the personal and the political. The Penn Laura Pels Foundation for International Theater Award for Master American Dramatist honors a writer working indisputably at the highest level of achievement. Penn has long been known as a community of writers, comprised mainly of novelists and essayists, but playwrights have always been essential to the Penn community. Larry's plays are as relevant now as they were when they were first performed, as evidenced by the three Tony Awards that the 2011 Broadway revival of The Normal Heart won, a testament to the play's enduring strength and popularity. For more than three decades, Larry has worked to bring a crucial awareness to the fight against HIV AIDS, even in the face of censorship and condemnation by his peers. He has forced and engaged the American public to appreciate the human element of gay culture with his amazing novel, Faggots, and brought a sense of urgency to the fight against AIDS with his many essays, in particular his essay 1,112 and counting. Larry is passionate in his work, giving voice to an underrepresented community, and in this way, he has followed in Penn's long tradition of author as activist, taking his place alongside Philip Roth, Edward Albee, A.M. Holmes, Toni Morrison, and Kurt Vonnegut, to name a few. With intimate knowledge of the experience of being censored themselves, these defenders of free speech went on to become champions for others, taking Penn's mission of protecting and celebrating free expression to the streets, shouting to be heard, tireless in their, cam tireless in their campaign for equality and justice. And Larry Kramer is firmly a part of this tradition. He has always been fighting this fight, and his work exemplifies this. His visionary talents were summed up nicely by this year's awards judges, quote, activism as art rarely, rarely sustains itself over time. After the root cause of the political gesture have faded, they wrote. But through humor, anger, and vulnerability, Larry's plays continue to demand attention, proving that theater can indeed change the world, save lives, and move audiences to action, end quote. And next year, an even wider audience will have the opportunity to experience Larry's work. I have the great privilege to be part of bringing the normal heart to the screen in the HBO film directed by Ryan Murphy, which Larry sort of did the impossible. And he took what already was a great piece of theatrical literature and turned that into a nearly greater piece of film literature. He modernized it. He brought a deeper understanding to that culture to it and was able to be honest in a way that Broadway at the time would not have allowed. In recognition of his mastery of craft and passion, I am delighted to present Larry with the limited first edition of Eugene O'Neill's collected early plays signed by Mr. Eugene O'Neill himself. things come to he who waits. Uh, <laughs> when you lie in a hospital bed 
and I've been in one now almost well, a good part of this past year, you not only are bored out of your mind, but you think certain things, not necessarily of death, because I do not intend to death, to die. There's still so much work to do. Um, but of how to get it done. I had a, a, a great agent once named Peggy Ramsey in London who said early on in my writing career, Larry, you must never pay any attention to what anyone says, whether it's good or bad. It just gets in the way. So you will forgive me if I will sidestep this great honor and, and, and move on. Um, <laughs> A's is out of control again. You don't know it. The world doesn't know it. It's a plague again. Not that it ever wasn't. All over the world. <clears throat> not only in the third world, but in this country as well. Numbers are slowly rising. Numbers in America, numbers in New York, numbers among white people are slowly going up, no matter how many of the treatments are available. And of course, they're never enough, and they're never available to the right people or to all the people. The one thing that I never can get out of my mind is this plague, is that this plague is intentional, that it was allowed to happen and is allowed to continue. The desolatory progress that is being made, the lack of commitment from people who should be making it is just overwhelming. The lack of government, proper government response is, is, is criminal. This is not a matter of opinion. This is for real. What is happening in Africa, in Russia, in Southeast Asia, there won't be any world left the way we're going. There's no way that we can take care of all the people who are sick now and getting sick, even if we gave them antiretroviral drugs. <coughs> I want to talk about today's theater. <coughs> and I may not make so many friends with this. <coughs> Today's theater is too small. Play after play opens, is beautifully produced, gets great reviews, disappears, becomes one of a string of plays just like it that after a while you can't remember one from another. What did it say? What did it strive for? What did it seek to change? you damned if you can remember. We simply have to think bigger as writers. We have to push our talent as far as it can go and then some. We have to reach for the moon and stars. Hard as it may be, we have to try and change the world. Thank you. It's now my honor to introduce, for some closing remarks, the Penn Executive Director, Suzanne Nossel. When I joined Penn as its Executive Director earlier this year, people described it as an organization with a dual mission. We promote literature and we protect free expression and human rights. You could see it on those two lines. And they would sometimes describe those goals as separate, as kind of two parallel lines that, that don't meet. 
But after nine months on the job, I really see those goals as intertwined, and tonight is a great illustration of why. The Pet Awards are based on literary merit. Judges carefully select works that they think best meet the criteria. Yet so often the works chosen as exemplars of literary achievement also embody themes central to the fight for rights and for freedoms. Take Sergio de la Pava, who explores the contradictions and limits of the US criminal justice system. Catherine Boo, who spins stories of families in the slums of Mumbai living on the underside of prosperity. Daniel Borzutsky, who translated Raul Zarita's 20 poems, each named after one of Pinochet's prisons. And of course, Larry Kramer, who became the gay rights movement's prophet of doom and one of its greatest catalysts for progress. Tonight, we've come together as a literary community to celebrate their works and dozens of others. It's exciting and it's inspiring, but that's only part of the reason why we've come. Those two prongs of Penn's mission reinforce each other. Defending writers who sit in prisons, face torture, or find their works banned makes us cherish the fruits of free expression. And rejoicing in those fruits, as we've done tonight, fuels our passion to defend it. More than 25 years ago at a Penn Congress here in New York, a fight broke out between two titans, Saul Bellow and Gunter Gross. Bellow was ruminating on the American dream when Gross took him to task for ignoring those left behind. He offered to take Bellow, who was then living in gritty inner city Chicago, on a tour of the South Bronx. Bellow did not take kindly to the offer. Gross, gripped by anger, returned to his seat. He poked a young Salman Rushdie, the Congress's sole South Asian delegate, saying, say something. Who, me? Yes, you. So Rushdie took the mic. He asked Bellow why so many American writers abdicated, abdicated the task of taking on America's immense power in the world. Writers, Bellow bellowed, don't have tasks. We have inspirations. At least in the retelling, Bellow had the final word. For the writers of Penn, the defense of free expression and human rights is not a task, but an inspiration. So it's no coincidence that so many of the writers whose inspiration we celebrate tonight tell stories that in ways both, both overt and subtle probe the abuse of power and the abuse of rights, whether the political or the personal. By appreciating them, we remember what's ultimately at stake in the fight for free expression. The exposés, provocations, and plot twists we applaud tonight would not have been possible without the protections we enjoy. Around the world, there are writers with the ideas, the passion, the insight to produce other great works, works we might have honored in this ceremony, except that they were never written. They were stillborn in the minds of authors who live in fear. And now, at Penn, we're concerned that our freedom is being encroached upon in the place we least suspected, which is here at home. How do writers react to the revelation that their emails, their phone calls, all the live tweets you've been sending tonight have been vacuumed up into NSA servers? We've reached out to our writers to ask, and the answers we're getting worry us. Writers haven't stopped texting, tweeting, and browsing, but many have told us that they avoid certain topics. They fear who's reading and why. It's Penn's job to remind our politicians that while surveillance has its uses, it also has its risks. We don't want a society where artists pick subjects based on what the government permits. We don't want a society that never he reads or hears stories that go unwritten out of fear. We don't want a society where challenges are swallowed before they can be voiced. Tonight, by celebrating the great works free expression can produce, we remember the high price that a surrender of free expression will exact. Hours before the ceremony, a Penn team landed in Doha, Qatar to press for the freedom of poet Muhammad Al-Ajami. He wrote two poems and for that got sentenced to 15 years in prison. He's one example of the artists we fight for in Ethiopia, in Iran, in China, in Syria, and in the United States. Thank you all for taking part in this wonderful celebration and for joining Penn as members, supporters, and participants in our events, programs, and campaigns, those that celebrate and those that defend. 
Our calendar is packed with events, some of which are listed in your program. I want to call attention just to one. The Penn World Voices Festival, started by Salman Rushdie, who is looking for more opportunities to mix it up with international writers. It has brought nearly 1,500 writers from 78 countries speaking 56 languages here to New York every spring. We'll mark its 10th anniversary next year, and we hope you'll celebrate with us. Thank you for the passion that brings Penn's dual mission to life. The agents, publishers, editors, and writers in this room are living examples of what Penn stands for. You guard that indivisible combination of literary excellence and the freedom necessary to achieve it. You honor the vision of Saul Bellow and of Gunter Grass. You shoulder tasks, provide the inspiration, and preserve this tradition for writers around the world and in generations yet to come. Thank you. Suzanne Nassau. And now it is my honor to say, let the drinking begin. Thank you.